Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to uh, uh, participate in such a prestigious uh, series. Liberalism is now positioned on a number of trajectories, some rising and others falling, some sweeping in their ambition to inclusivity and others ruptured in their incompleteness and fragmentation. In some academic circles, a sanitized and abstract political philosophical vision has exercised prestigious sway over research and teaching. While in the rough and tumble of politics, liberalism is at best making slow headway, often found with its back against the wall and frequently on the retreat. Pretenders and usurpers parade the streets, kitted out in liberal clothing, sowing doubt and confusion. Liberalism has been hailed as the winning ideology by those who lack a sense of history and are ignorant of comparative politics. It has been condemned as a dominant ideology by those who see it as a tool in the hands of elitist cultural minorities or oppressive economic interests. It has been denounced as wishy-washy by those who insist that power is about uh, political power is about decisiveness, about results rather than processes. It has been trashed by those who proudly flaunt what they term a democratic illiberalism, and in doing so managed to distort the very idea of democracy. So to say all this poses a challenge for political theorists and students of political ideologies and ideas, and to say that it is, is a challenge is actually an understatement. Obviously, there's no correct version of liberalism. There never can be. We thankfully occupy indeterminate worlds. And liberalism exhibits a curious mixture of conceptual imprecision and ethical confidence. But the main, main problem lies in the tendency to dumb down, to oversimplify, to deny complexity. Unfortunately for any ideology, to work, it has to sacrifice finesse for practical impact and rhetorical efficiency. But liberalism seems to be a particularly intricate set of ideas that makes few concessions to the demands of popular simplification, and it therefore requires unpacking at many levels. The flight from complexity, one we constantly witness when our political leaders engage in public discourse, is all around us. It used to be said of democracy that it would introduce mediocrity into public affairs by drawing in the hoi polloi, the masses. What was not foreseen at the time is that mediocrity would be introduced from the top, starving liberalism of the subtlety and reflectiveness that is both its great attraction and its potential downfall. But let us be clear here. Liberalism is one of the most central and pervasive political theories and ideologies, despite its belittling from the left and the right, and despite its appropriation by other creeds. Indeed, that is one of liberalism's notable or more notable successes, the quiet permeation of some of its features into other ideological families. Its history carries a crucial heritage of civilized thinking, of political practice, and a philosophical, ethical creativity. Without it, one could not conceive of a modern state that places the good of individuals before that of rulers, that recognizes both the limits and the possibilities of government, that enables the market exchanges necessary to proper standards of living, that respects the law and constitutional arrangements. But liberalism has achieved more than that, it has also in recent times upheld the concern for the plight and the welfare of the disadvantaged, and it has even more recently insisted on sensitivity to social differences within a society. In particular, it's important to note the changes that liberalism has undergone and has either introduced into broader political discourse or has had to assimilate into its own ideational practices. Because we always need to assess an ideological movement, not by any one of its narrow temporal and spatial manifestations in the here and now, but by its optimal potential, not as an ideal type, but to the extent that each component of that combined potential has actually been displayed empirically at some stage in its lifespan. Now, the name liberalism 
as, as you will know, was coined just, just over 200 years ago. But long before that, it had an early proto-history. The, 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 the concept without the name. And it reflected the desire to curb absolute rule by defining the limits of government, including the right to resist tyranny and it introducing the rule of law and the sanctity of contracts. At a later stage, it embraced the project of human emancipation, closely connected to theories of natural rights. In the influential, influential Lockean version, the insistence on the fundamental status of the rights to life, liberty, and estate heralded the idea of an underlying human quality alongside the universality of that claim. And that, together with that, emerged what one might call a cult of the individual, an anthropocentric view of the world in which individuals were the possessors of valuable attributes, such as the power of reason, and as such, they were worthy both of political and personal respect. It was a liberalism of releasing human energy in the shape of economic entrepreneurship and free markets, opening boundaries both within and beyond national borders. And it was initially underpinned by an ethical vision of the spread of well-being. But the social unit was clearly the entrepreneur, not just the, the economic entrepreneur, but the entrepreneur in general sense, the, the, the initiator, the, 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 even the, the, the ideational inventor, uh, um, focused on personal advancement that would indirectly also benefit others. The crucial significance of those modes of thinking and of conceiving the role of politics has, of course, not diminished. But over the past two centuries, liberalism has experienced further dramatic shifts. And I will enumerate them in the, in the, in the, in the form of a number of milestones. So the first milestone was the move from a static, steady state to a dynamic developmental flow. That is to say, from a belief system emphasizing the creation of private spaces between individual and individual in order to protect their areas of liberty. Uh, it's a kind of keep off the grass view of, of, of what is mine and what isn't mine. And that is a horizontal view of the relations between individual and individual. That then switched to a vertical and temporal theory of movement and of change, encapsulated in John Stuart Mill's famous phrase, the free development of individuality, through which people could grow their specific talents and skills, thus unlocking human capacity. So liberalism now encouraged the cultivation of a maturing and progressing individual, not just of a static individual. And from that time on, liberalism became a creed about the gradual but assured civilizing of societies over time. And history became the open-ended stage on which that would happen. The second milestone occurred at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries. Liberals incorporated new theories claiming scientific validity that were swirling around in the ideational environment at the time. Now, ideologies jump at the slightest opportunity of recruiting scientific evidence, or what is considered to be scientific evidence, in their support, in the hope that that will make them invincible. And one such notion at the turn of the 19th, 20th century was a theory that focused on the social nature of human beings. That was an innovation, certainly in terms of, of liberalism, in particular their interdependence and the mutual benefits that could be derived from their sociability. It sought to replace the atomistic monadism that had previously reigned supreme in the liberal tradition. Mutual assistance was necessary for both individual and social flourishing. Another change here was the marrying of recent, recent in the 19th century Darwinian ideas of evolution with already established 18th century ideas of progress, and the result being an almost teleological insistence on the increased rationality and cooperation of the human race. And yet another uh, uh, change was an extension of Mill's prevention of harm principle to cover not only physical and social harm, but also, as the 20th century progressed, emotional and psychological injury. 
instead of the individual as an assertive, even aggressive entrepreneur at the heart of a system of free trade, liberal free trade, new ideas were emerging from psychology and sociology that suggested that human beings were existentially precarious entities and that human fragility and interdependence were normal rather than aberrations or character defects. So the 19th century version of the independent, energetic and autonomous individual had to share space with the 20th century version of a more vulnerable and dependent individual. Individuals were not just bundles of ability-oriented needs that had to be satisfied to gain full human realization, underpinning liberalism's fully functional and autonomous individual capable ostensibly of perfectibility, or at least capable of purposive improvability. They also now required continual mutual support, unable fully to control their own lives and their own futures. And so what had in the past been ascribed to personal weakness became reconceptualized, eliciting the concern and empathy that came of a universal human condition. That reformed liberalism descended from the heights of exclusive and high culture that was produced through eminent thinkers and philosophers, and its ideas were no longer chiefly disseminated through self-interested merchants and industrialists, because the spread of education, the increasing popularization of the printed word meant that liberal thinking was taken up not by the comfortable bourgeoisie, bankers and businessmen, but by the conscientious professional groups, journalists and writers, progressive churchmen, municipal reformers and the like, who express themselves through the press, ethical societies, political discussion groups and universities. In all that, the state was drafted in as an enabler rather than an enforcer, clearing the path when individuals were unable to exercise their own choice and self-develop without assistance. And consequently, liberty was conceptually extended to include non-human hindrances that it now appeared had as damaging an effect on human life as physical or verbal interferences. Poverty, unemployment, ill health, and ignorance were now understood to undermine or reduce the capacity for free action and constituted serious, often insurmountable threats to individual liberty that could only be countered by collective action. This paved the ground for the welfare state, which was an overwhelmingly liberal creation. That the formulation of liberty was however met with opposition by some liberals. 63 years ago, uh, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin gave his famous lecture, Two Concepts of Liberty on the distinction between negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty, he argued, related to the absence of intervention and coercion in the individuals' lives. But positive liberty, he saw as a totalitarian imposition of self-mastery on those who fail to pursue their higher or real nature, a variant on forcing people to be free and rational. But Berlin missed out on invoking a gentler positive liberty, a far gentler positive liberty, that rather dictating to individuals what was good for them, simply wished to put at their disposal the conditions or remove the hindrances that would empower them to self-develop effectively. And the 19th century liberal philosopher uh, uh, Thomas Hill Green depicted, depicted liberty as, and I quote, a positive power or capacity of doing or enjoying something worth doing or enjoying in common with others. In his preface to the English translation of Guido de Ruggiero's acclaimed uh, History of European Liberalism, would, regards the state not as the vehicle of a superhuman wisdom or a superhuman power, but as the organ by which a people express whatever of political ability it can find and breed and train within itself. The most radical and innovative ideas of that kind emanated from a group known as the New Liberals, spearheaded by, by, by two uh, thinkers, uh, writers, and, and, and journalists, 
uh, Leonard Hobhouse and Jay Hobson, who stood out as the two most important British liberal thinkers of the 20th century. They are not so much well known for that, but I insist that these still are the two most important liberal thinkers of the 20th century in the UK. Because Hobhouse was much more famous, Hobson, sorry, was much more famous as, as a theorist of imperialism, but I think his contribution to liberalism was, was extraordinary. Now, these two people drew a near anthropological and sociological findings for which human interdependence was not only an empirical fact, but a moral reflection of human altruism and mutual responsibility. Hobhouse contended that in order to exercise effective liberty, mutual aid is not less important than mutual forbearance. And by elevating liberty and welfare to twin liberal ends, they accepted the degree of state intervention in individual lives, provided provided such intervention still served the self-development of individuals, the furtherance of a rational common good, and the humanist conception of well-being. The welfare state, at its best, was a political manifestation of those less liberal tendencies, uh, and the liberalism that sustained it has been, or more accurately used to be, one of Britain's most significant exports. And just to, to, to give a quote from, <clears throat> from Hobbes to get some idea, from, sorry, from Hobson, difficult to, I always confuse the two. Uh, um, in a memorable passage, uh, distilling the, the best in the progressive liberal tradition, Hobson wrote, and I quote, Liberalism is now formally committed to a task which certainly involves a new conception of the state in relation to the individual life and to private enterprise. From the standpoint, standpoint which best presents its continuity with earlier liberalism, it appears as a fuller appreciation and realization of individual liberty contained in the provision of equal opportunities for self-development. But to this individual standpoint must be joined a just apprehension of the social. That is to say, the insistence that those claims or rights of self-development be adjusted to the sovereignty of social welfare. And he elaborated over a century ago, he wrote this in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, what, what, what a good society needs is <clears throat> free land, free travel, free power, free credit, security, justice, and education, no man is free for the full purposes of civilized life unless he has all those liberties. Uh, quite an extraordinary uh, uh, program uh, relate in, in comparison to what has actually been achieved in, 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 even in the most advanced societies. <clears throat> so liberals' adaptive powers have been one of its great strengths propelled by four underlying changes. First, the, this increasing knowledge of social interdependence, which I've just talked about, and, uh, and uh, that, that involved an organic theory of, of, of interlinkage that was transformed into an unusual liberal communitarianism that emphasized not the dependence of the part on the whole, which you very often find in organic theories, but the opposite, the dependence of the whole on the health of each and every part, just like the body will atrophy unless every one of its parts is healthy. Second, the epistemological recognition of future time as involving risks and uncertainties, and hence requiring planned anticipatory responses that aimed at least at partially meeting those future contingencies. So progress, that core liberal value, is open-ended and optimistic rather than predetermined. But you can also see how attaching uncertainty to the core concept of, of rationality incorporates this newer notion of human fragility. Third, a belief that democracy was endowed with taming and mitigating attributes that could counterbalance the reductionist view of the state as an instrument of external and sectional power. Of course, that always runs up against the obvious problem that democracy can also reject liberal and welfare solutions as it does time and time again. So the rather naive faith of liberals in the irresistible, rational and singular integrity of liberal social policy and vision has founded repeatedly on the rocks of democratic heterogeneity and disruptiveness. 
but that is something that paradoxically liberals do appreciate. They're, they're, they're prepared to be challenged. I think that's part of the idea of a, of a reasonable uh, political system. And fourth, the understanding that human societies were subject to laws of social evolution and that liberalism neither could uh, uh, nor was uh, a doctrinaire and, and static creed. So those transformations breathe discursive persuasiveness into the ideational power of liberalism, and they combined with a genuine concern for the plight of those who had carried the heavy burdens of the Industrial Revolution on their shoulders, as well as a realization that an active citizenship was a sine qua non of the new politics. The flip side of all this was that intellectual, fa intellectual fashions, however illuminating, need to be translated into simple terms to arouse electoral interest, that with the rise of organized labor, liberals were not the only ones competing over social policies that would attract the allegiance of the dispossessed, and also that liberals lacked the emotional and populist appeal that mass politics was demanding. I'll come back to that. But there are three other milestones that liberals have confronted since the end of the 20th century, much more recent ones, and they have been troubling and to some extent confusing. Liberals have strained to find the conceptual apparatus, let alone the practical solutions for such issues. The first is that much public focus began to shift towards cultural groupings, diverse ethnicities, religions, and more recently, multiple gender identities that disjointedly make up a society. Liberals were initially caught unawares, since the emphasis on universality, unity, harmony, consensus, and ethical homogeneity saw such distinctions as bridgeable in the pursuit of a greater social good, if indeed they took heed of them in the first place. But that sobering encounter with a changing reality has been deeply problematic for liberals, used to a dualistic political world of individuals and states, or in, in, in earlier times, individuals and governments. The advent of cultural groupings as a major political force has thrown a spanner in the liberal works. The question has become which social groups can claim for themselves some of the rights and identities previously reserved for individuals alone, spurred on by new ideas about equal recognition, the enabling of voice, broadening participation, and group dynamics. Professor Bajpai has produced pioneering work on group differentiated rights in India, and so I won't talk about it because this is her, uh, she knows a hundred times more about that than I do, uh, including special cultural rights and legislative quotas, and these illustrate some of the challenges that liberals are now confronting group diversity must negotiate. So the problem for liberals here is twofold. First on the whole, ethnic and religious groups don't interpret their identity as a matter of choice. Liberalism is always based on, on, on the idea of, 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 of exit and entrance of choice as to what identity you wish to, you wish to adopt. And the second problem is that some cultural groups can hold views that are substantively at odds with liberal fundamentals. So free choice and voluntarism are at risk, in which case so is a fundamental tenet of all the variants of the liberal family. No less troublesome is the degree of liberal conduct for which read open, self-critical, right-sensitive, non-dogmatic and inclusive, that liberals require from groups living in a broadly liberal society. <clears throat> I should add immediately that so-called liberal societies themselves rarely live up to their own optimal standards, views and expectations. But how do liberals deal with problems of gender inequality in many religious practices? How do they handle doctrinaire rigidity as a non-negotiable negotiable article of faith of some groups, including secular groups? Cultural integrity versus individual dignity can coincide, but they can also pull in, to, in opposite directions. And yet both, as we know, can be clothed in liberal values, equality of individual treatment versus respect for lifestyle autonomy. Reflective dialogue versus protection of, in, in, in uh, quotes, authentic beliefs. <clears throat> and hence, liberals have frequently experienced zero 
so zero sum cul de sacs stark either or choices that don't enable compromise. One very well known example is in the United States, the impasse between pro life and pro choice over abortion rights which has persevered with liberals largely, largely lining up on one side of the debate. And another, uh, even more notable in so many countries now, is the issue of wearing headscarves, the hijab or niqab. And that's a striking example of how one can argue either side of the case through using liberal principles. If you are liberal, who believes in the universality of human rights, you will regard the bestowing of special rights and particular religious or ethnic groups as an infringement of the universal equality principle, which is inherent to liberalism. But if you are a liberal who wishes to respect the particularity of individual and group lifestyles, you will regard the imposition of uniform rules as a suppression of the uniqueness of cultures and the variety of human practices. Both are liberal principles but they are not reconcilable. So you can be a liberal who objects to women wearing headscarves in public because you consider that to be a form of illiberal sartorial oppression of women by male-dominated cultures. Or you can be a liberal who supports the wearing of, of headscarves because to ban them is an illiberal form of coercion that undermines group identity and does not respect the stated preference of some women. Crucially, you can't support both positions at the same time. Yet again, demonstrating that liberalism or liberalisms in the plural, like all ideologies, are culturally located in particular areas. They're culturally provincial and internally divided. And hence the mythical harmony of principles so coveted by liberals in their own imaginations begins to crumble. And they too, like any belief system, are faced with a different kind of choice. The choice regarding which liberal principles to retain and which to drop. And these dilemmas are compounded or, or mirrored by the bifurcation between different liberal traditions. So if you are a social liberal who holds that individual flourishing can only be achieved through removing obstacles to the liberal ends of choice and opportunity, and the only sufficiently strong agency to accomplish that is the state, then a privately operated free market will undermine that end. The exercise of economic power by some over others will oppress and limit those who for whatever reason, are marginalized in terms of market opportunities. But if you are a market liberal who holds that the state is a paternalist agency that stifles choice and diversity, a nanny state, you will regard its measures as illiberal and deserving of resistance. Now, contemporary liberals have resorted to various techniques to attempt to address such issues or, or, or bypass such issues or dodge such issues, whatever you choose here. Salient among those techniques is the advocacy of state neutrality, to be neutral with regard to different individual conceptions of the good life. That's been a very common and frequently expressed a view among American political theorists, uh, uh, particularly towards the end of the 20th century. I prefer to call this not neutrality, but the silence of the state. A particular preference of the state, keeping quiet, shutting up, looking, avoiding, sort of averting its gaze. In this case, though, it's principle, it, it is packaged as a principle a principal view of, 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 of what the state does. But of course, advocating state neutrality is not itself a neutral viewpoint. It self-presents as a liberal position, though one might immediately add an unsatisfactory liberal position that cannot be realized in political practice. And that runs up against two problems. First, the advocates of neutrality don't see it as withdrawing from the public sphere, but as, as a constructive preservation of a non-judgmental ethos aimed at enhancing the quality of public political life. 
However, the decision to stay away from so-called private matters simply endorses the status quo pertaining to those current practices and deprives or potentially deprives liberalism of its reforming potential. A neutral state, neutral state doesn't intervene, doesn't take sides. We just let things go on as they are or carry on as they are. And the second problem is that state neutrality is firmly anchored in a specific, rather conventional liberalism that adheres to the separation of public and private, which used to be those those, those, those mantras of of, of liberalism, public versus the the, the private. But that runs up, and we are now much more aware of that, it runs up against the boundary problems of delineating that permeable border between public and private. Problems that themselves are dictated by cultural differences and by changing understandings. So if there is a border at all, it is constantly shifting or, 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 or gates are opening up in, in the middle of those fences uh, uh, that, that ostensibly distinguish public from private. Is objection to the COVID vaccination a private choice? Or is it a stance that has crucial public importance because it may harm others? So here we have just one recent example of the of the collapse, really, of this public-private division. In addition, a powerful feminist critique condemned the ostensible sanctuary of private space because it drew a veil behind which oppressive and unregulated patriarchal power may be and is exercised by men over women. So the private had lost much of its attraction. I'm not saying that there are not important areas that are still private, but it has become highly controversial in certain areas of of, of, uh, social uh, policy. So I was talking about three recent uh, problematic milestones. The second one is linked with what is vaguely and misleadingly called the democratization of politics. Liberals, you will recall, welcomed democracy in the mid-19th century, even though reluctantly, and of course they continue to welcome it and to see it as an essential corollary of their own creed. But democracy was embraced by liberals as a means to draw in marginalized voices into the realm of the political to emancipate and harness new forces in the joint social endeavor of improving collective life, alongside opening up the opportunities to share in the rich bounty of socially produced goods. One liberal weekly put this very nicely uh, over a century ago, a claim for a share in life. And so the the, the idea uh, of of liberal democracy was, was, was to see it as an unrushed procedure, not as a quick fix discharged by counting who got the most votes. Majorities are now comprehended as quantifiable constructs, and the very legitimacy of their causes is determined primarily by totaling up votes, not by any appeal to the content or the value or the quality of what is being counted. It's like a, 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 it's, it's, it's a spectacle, a competitive games, a, a, an election is, a, has, has been transformed or reduced to this, this sort of thing. Who gets the largest number? Not what is the end result of this democratic process. And that is, I'm, I'm afraid, most prominent in, in first past the post electoral system, such as the British one, which is known as winner takes all, but it's more worryingly be known as loser takes nothing because that is actually what happens in, 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 in the system where just one person is, is elected to uh, represent the entire population. So unsurprisingly, liberals can't fail to be unnerved by the rather different genies that have been unleashed from the bottle of democracy that have appropriated the word democracy for their purposes. In particular, It is increasingly people elected to positions at the top of the democratic political hierarchies who lack liberal enlightenment and use their power to weaken the very liberal democratic practices that enable them to acquire legitimacy. One still hopes that when governments lose their liberal moorings, the constitutional states in which they operate do not. But it can be touch and go. 
Excuse me. As can be seen in Eastern Europe, we become familiar courtesy of uh, Hungary's Viktor Orban with the term illiberal democracy as a badge of honor worn by European state and practiced by a government proud to abandon liberalism. And Poland is not too, too far behind in that evolutionary trajectory. And as we all know, the United States in the meantime embarked for four years on what I call an insultocracy, in which the president relished in attacking his own citizens in a manner unprecedented in the post-1945 democratic world and dismantling whatever proper political and legal procedures his warped memory could recall during his endless Twitter missives. So perhaps one way of learning about liberalism is to study its mirror images, and another is to analyze its false friends and distortions. And this ties into the third uh, problematic millstone, the rise and rise of social media, a mode of discourse to which liberals are particularly ill-suited the speed of stimulus and response, the quasi-random and unstructured diffusion of participation in debate, the marshalling of unaccountable and irresponsible but coordinated networks that attempt to manipulate and marketize opinions, the indiscriminate weight attributed to import into the public arena and the consequent dumbing down of discussion, all these often leave liberals out in the cold while the demotic replaces the democratic. We need to recall Jean-Jacques Rousseau's comment on the general will, something that people overlook in in one of the crucial sentences in in the social contract. He writes that the, the, the general will has to be properly informed, and I can't underline this more more strongly, has to be properly informed for a trustworthy political system to emerge. Thus, to take my own country, the calamity of Brexit for the United Kingdom was that it was based on a profoundly uninformed referendum in which ignorance, lies, fantasy, and a deep distrust of constitutional politics replaced measured consideration. And as for the media, in a world of digitalization, sound bites, and online short-termism, of fast food and quick visits to the cut-price supermarket of ideas, most of which are hastily discarded when they reach their sell-by date, which is usually very quickly, the slow-cooking liberals that that liberals delight in, the the alternative to to fast food, the slow-cooking in which they delight, is misunderstood and rejected. Liberalism is not an ideology for the impatient. The reflective liberal approach, regrettably, does not attract mass support. It's not an ideology for those who have the political equivalent of an attention deficit disorder. And above all, it's not an ideology designed to produce the irrevocable irrevocable finality that many people expect of a political system, a finality that politics then inevitably fails to deliver. For the new, and I put this again in inverted commas, the new Democrats, that is indeed indeed immensely frustrating. For the liberals, it should be commendable. There's little doubt that the impact of liberalism can no longer be gauged in terms of party success, but rather as a body of ideas that has percolated into and tempered neighboring bodies of thought, including versions of conservatism, social democracy, and even green political thought. And I repeat, liberalism has never been a universal ideology or even one with a chance of becoming universal, despite the visions and aspirations of many of its formulators and spearheads. It is a parochial ideology masquerading as a universal one. Indeed, currently, and I'm not, 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 this is not a a critique of mine, it's just, it's just a fact. Uh, It will be a a shocking or extremely surprising if it were really a universal ideology. So, currently, liberalism is not just a set of beliefs struggling for a place in the sun, as it always has been, and more often than not successfully, but a beleaguered set of beliefs under siege. For an ideology that has always demonstrated extraordinary powers of adaptability that might amount to a serious impediment, 
This is problematic, but it is one partly of its own making. Liberalism has, has, is partly responsible for its own failures. And again, I'm not, I'm, this is not a balance sheet of, 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 of uh, successes and failures. All I'm saying is that uh, uh, it, it would be remiss of me as, as, as an analyst of, of liberalism not to mention its failures alongside its successes. And the new forms of, of messaging are also intertwined with the fragmentation of dominant mentalities and rhetorics within political language. When we observe the different languages circulating within, within one linguistic community, we can identify the difficulties of translation, not among different language groups, but between the languages of the same group, the languages of bureaucrats, the language of politicians, the language of journalists, the language of academics, let alone the kind of everyday vernacular through which societies and the subgroups express themselves. These languages are often unbridgeable or bridgeable only with great difficulty, even if they're using the same language, so to speak. Liberals have never been good at navigating among those internal languages and their discourse lacks the common touch. And some may see this as a consequence of liberalism's over-rationality and intellectualization. But that's only partly true. The problem is not that of an overwhelming adherence to cerebral reason, but has to do with cultural styles relating to the structure of rhetoric, the regard for processes, and the critical sincerity attached to belief. Performativity and emotion, and liberals discovered this late in, in the life of liberalism, performativity and emotion are vital components of political thinking. In performative displays of collective, collective solidarity or group protests, liberals are still novices. Although the long battle for women's equality and dignity from the suffragettes to the Me Too activism is a liberal movement, even many feminists would deny the label liberal. And as I've frequently mentioned in, in, in various talks of mine over the years, liberals don't sing. The communists have their internationale, the Nazis have their horse vessel lead, Liberals have no esprit de corps rousing equivalent with its quick fix, feel good factor and its sense of camaraderie. Liberals have been too fixated with the power of the word, underestimating the politics and the language of politics are significantly visual and vocal, not just verbal. True, liberals also have their rigid sticking points, the red lines that they will not cross. They have strong feelings, very strong feelings, on protecting a range of human rights, a revulsion from torture and the death penalty, and some sense of fundamental fairness, all of which arouse strong emotions. And liberals, too, can get angry, but their anger is not that of a mob on the rampage who perceive an injustice. Perhaps it's also a feeling of self-righteousness, but there are no entirely non-dogmatic ideologies. They can rather distinguish by the scope of doctrinarism and by the justifications of their inflexibility. And to the extent that politics is about the quest for finality that I mentioned earlier, which is the attempt to resolve for once and for all, at least that's, that's, that's the, 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 the hope, the attempt to resolve for once and for all and remove certain topics from public debate, even if that attempt is always doomed to failure, liberals are no exception. They also try to remove certain things from debate. Indeed, the liberal practice of protecting and prioritizing a specific value by enshrining it as a right is a finality device par excellence. When I say I want something, I need something, no, I have a right to something, people pick up their ears. Ah, this is, this is a more important thing than just I want or I need. And that is an attempt to, to introduce finality to a discourse. I have a right, and rights are non-negotiable. At least that is the idea of what a right is. A right indicates something that cannot be tampered with without dehumanizing its bearers. It is hors de combat. It's, 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 it's not part of, not, 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 not within the field of combat. It's a rational and emotional conversation stopper for those who swear by it. I have a right. End of conversation. So this is perhaps one of the weapons that liberals try to use and, 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 and think it is important to use. Um, and yet liberals are pretty ineffective at what, after all, is a crucial 
feature the political appealing to and utilizing sentiment and passion for large scale recruitment and support purposes. And consequently, they've been unable to develop the kind of rhetoric and language that has effective mobilizing power. Now, my last few uh, sentences I, I, I will devote to the economic sides of liberalism. I have spent little time on that except to mention free trade, which at its 19th century best, and of course, overlooking, overlooking the dark underside of imperialism, of which India was both a partial beneficiary and a victim of its racism and oppression, was conceived by liberal internationalists as a civilizing mission with ethical aspirations. But now let me turn, and I see already somebody has, has, has directed a question at me, uh, uh, to what is now termed neoliberalism and how neoliberalism threatens to usurp the word liberal while banishing the liberal tradition. Neoliberalism is an aggressive predator that has colonized and misappropriated much of the liberal space and left the latter occasionally starved for oxygen. The problematic of neoliberalism is a product mainly of the second half of the 20th century, even though its ideas are considerably older. Within the complexity of the liberal cocktail, neoliberalism advance, emphasizes the beneficial consequences of competitive markets and personal advancement far more than the general nourishing of human well-being. And those who think that liberalism is largely about unrestrained private activity and those who believe liberalism is about the reasonable development of individuals in a mutually supporting and project-sharing society don't have too much in common. And this merits stating and restating because so many critics of liberalism are really objecting to its nemesis, to neoliberalism. Alternatively, as was evident in East European countries that just emerged from behind the Iron Curtain, a narrow market liberalism that offered the illusion of plenty and prosperity after years of hardship was difficult to resist. In particular, the liberal intelligentsia in countries such as Poland sought refuge in a civil society whose main characteristic was a deep distrust of an antagonism towards the state that had oppressed them for decades. In contrast to the pact that advanced Western North European welfare liberals had struck with the state. So the confusion between liberalism and neoliberalism threatens the integrity and coherence of the liberal project. Given that liberalism is a mixture of a number of intersecting core concepts, such as uh, uh, liberty, individuality, progress, reason, constrained power, and inclusivity in considering the general good, its impoverished shadow, neoliberalism, retains only a very specific conception of liberty that crowds out the other core liberal values that need to coexist in an intricate balance. Those who associate Liberalism with free markets must take note that liberalism is a complex cluster of beliefs, and no belief can be allowed to maximize itself beyond the point where it begins to engender, endanger the other core liberal beliefs. Thus, the pursuit of liberty stops at the point where it endangers rationality or progress or individuality, and the pursuit of reason must not be allowed to silence liberty. That neoliberalism undermines liberalism in a number of, of, of important ways. First, it's created a new social unit to replace the individual, the client or the consumer. Specialized words in the UK, specialized words as a passenger or citizen have been supplanted by a generalized and faceless depersonalization of the classic liberal individual, the customer. In current jargon, the public has been reduced to taxpayers. Second, neoliberalism locates social, sociopolitical control in a top-heavy, politically unaccountable sphere. It's been well understood that the market, seemingly a release from constraints, imposes its own disciplines and punishes those unable to play by its rules with the stigmas of personal failure, of poverty, of marginalization, a very far cry from liberal humanism. Indeed, that is precisely what social liberals rebelled against the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Third, neoliberalism shifts social values towards a mastery of managerial management techniques that bring with them pseudo-efficiency. Pseudo-efficiency because efficiency is not always counted in quantifiable results, but also in terms of the 
of the of the quality of life that a society can uh, produce. And fourth, liberal universalism is ditched in favor of neoliberal globalism. The moral universalism of vision, of comprehensiveness, and of equal opportunity is replaced by a globalism of super conglomerates about power-hungry expansionism. And we are repeatedly told by some international relations scholars that we live under the aegis of a liberal world order. Strangely enough, though, that so-called liberal world order is almost entirely populated or, or, or dominated by conservative and right of center governments and subscribes to a narrower and antiquated range of human rights than progressive liberals would insist on. So liberalism and liberal thought have certainly moved on, but the perceptions of liberalism in the form of neoliberalism act to pull it back. And that too becomes a fact of little thinking and unawareness that sets its mark on a new reality. Thank you very much.